Welcome, good afternoon. My name is Felipe Gonzalez Castro, and I'm so pleased to have you join us today for this symposium that was sponsored, is sponsored by the Diversity Network Committee. And the name of that session is, or this session, Place-Based Approaches to Health Equity Among Members of Marginalized Groups, Weighing Reach, Adoption, Effectiveness, and Scalability. And appreciations to the Diversity Network Committee subcommittee that has worked diligently to create this for you. And so thank you to Dr. Karen Rogers, Vanessa Marshall, and Krista Meharry. What I would like to do is introduce each of our speakers just basically in terms of their background, and then we will go right into the first presentation by our featured speaker, Dr. Ross Glasgow. So first of all, Dr. Glasgow, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce him. He's the research professor of family medicine at the University of Colorado and director of the Dissemination and Implementation Science Program. He's known internationally for his work on REAIM and its recent modification uh, called PRISM. And this combination is a well-known entity. Dr. Glasso has over 450 peer-reviewed publications and is one of the most frequently cited social science scholars. His presentation is titled, Implications of and Opportunities Suggested by the REAIM Framework for Place-Based Approaches to Increase uh, Health Equity. Our second speaker, Dr. Uh, Miser Kiels, uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Human Development at the University of Chicago. She's the founding director of the Trauma Response Educational Practice Project, uh, which is a research uh, translation research to practice partnership. And her work bridges the gap between research and applied practice. Her presentation is titled Trauma Responsive Educational Practices. And third, Dr. Lillianne C. Windsor. She is associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign School of Social Work. She's the 2019-2020 Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow at the National Academy of Medicine. Her teaching interests include research methods, social justice, and substance use disorders. And her presentation is titled, Combining Most and CBPR to Build Sustainable, Efficient, and Effective Community-Based Interventions. Those will be our presentations. And just a brief word on the structure of this session. Each panelist will speak for about 20 minutes. At the end of the presentations, we will have about 30 minutes for question and answer from the panelists. Please use your chat function uh, to submit questions to a particular panelist, or if your question is for all of them, the panel itself, then please direct it that way. Without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Russ Glasgow. Russ, take it away. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, is my audio coming through okay? I'll assume that's a, assume that's a yes. Um, it's uh, great to be with you. Um, you can see from my title here, which is approximately a paragraph long, I hope to talk with you uh, both about our REAIM framework, uh, as Dr. Castro mentioned, and particularly how it might apply to place-based and contextual approaches uh, to re relate to health equity. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes, approximately. Uh, you can see I have five things there. So we have about four minutes uh, each, but I'll try to uh, navigate through this. But I'd like to talk about how equity is important at each of the re-aim dimensions, each of our five dimensions, uh, how critically important context is, I will focus, as I know some of our other presenters will, on adaptations, I'm, something I'm anticipating we may have some discussion about later on. And then I wanna close by focusing on uh, the issue of transparent reporting and how that might relate to uh, health equity issues. Next slide, please. So uh, just a, a bit of uh, introduction or a caveat. I honestly feel uh, both uh, humbled and a little bit intimidated talking to this audience where I know, uh, including uh, my fellow panelists here, uh, some of whom are real experts in health uh, disparities and health equity issue. But the notion here is for those of you that aren't familiar, Newcastle is the center in England that's kind of the 
uh, heart of coal country. So the notion is here uh, just that uh, take this, uh, if you will, with a grain of salt, but at least I can talk uh, with you from a re-aim perspective, what we've done and how we uh, think about conceptualizing some key issues related to health equity. Next slide. Okay, um, re-aim is one of many, last count over 160 uh, different uh, implementation science uh, theories or frameworks. Uh, re-aim is a framework that we have worked hard to try and make pragmatic or more generally useful. And as Dr. Castro said, uh, we've recently expanded it to be uh, either expanded re-aim or this PRISM model, uh, which I will explain in a, another minute or two. Next slide, please. So when we say pragmatic, uh, what do we mean by re-aim? Well, in addition to having technical features and definitions of these five dimensions you can see on the left-hand side, uh, it's the acronym that you can see for reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. Um, it has technical definitions. For example, in the uh, first dimension of reach uh, is defined as the percent or proportion and representativeness of individuals who participate when uh, offered uh, the chance to participate in a uh, program. Um, that though is pretty jargony and academic. So what we've tried to do, particularly over the last several years is to translate this into a much more user-friendly uh, jargon and definitions using the who, what, where, uh, how, and uh, why aspects. And the only one that I'm gonna take uh, time on here, because I think most of them are fairly intuitive, is I do want to just say a word about the implementation dimension in white there. Uh, this is the one that's the most complex and has the most components of the re-aim dimensions. And what we mean by it really is, first of all, what often we call fidelity, or it's how consistently is the program or policy delivered as intended. In addition though, in re-aim, we focus on adaptations that are made to either the intervention or how it's uh, implemented. I'll come back to that. Uh, a third important dimension for implementation is the cost. How much time and how much burden is involved with delivering a program? And then finally, both for implementation, but for all of these issues, the qualitative issue of why did these uh, results come about is really, really important. So again, take home message here, uh, this, uh, all these dimensions are important and contribute to overall outcome. Next slide, please. So a brief history, uh, as I note in the last slide, um, this year, uh, well actually the end of last year, Reaim is now 20 years old. We've been uh, using it, I hope continuing uh, to improve it, at least to change it over the 20 years. But all along, it's been intended to facilitate our translation of research into practice, and in particular, to balance uh, the focus on internal and external validity. From, from our perspective, historically, health services and almost all medical research has focused uh, almost predominantly on internal validity. And we feel that in order to make a difference in the real world, we also need to have an increased focus on external validity. REAIM does have factors, as you can see there, at both the individual participant or citizen consumer level and at the multi-level, I wanna stress that, multi-level setting factors that include things such as nested from a social ecologic perspective. You can think of communities, maybe neighborhoods, organization sites, and at the, the staff level. Next slide, please. So I do wanna spend a little bit of time on, this is one of two slides I, I wanna walk you through. And this is a hypothetical example uh, slide, but, but not too far from the truth. So what I'd like you to think about is given our current context, let's think about a uh, COVID uh, vaccine, if that was developed. And for a hypothetical discussion of equity, let's talk about uh, green people and blue people. And here's how the, the story works or this thought exercise. If you look at the uh, red uh, row there of effectiveness, 
this is what traditional health uh, uh, studies and uh, health services research usually focuses on is a primary outcome like effectiveness. So let's say if given the vaccine, how effective and is there a disparity uh, between its effects on red and green people? Well, let's assume zero, which is often the attention and then many times that's kind of end of discussion. But what I'd like to do is briefly walk you through these other re dimensions now. And let's assume at each of those that there's a 30% disparity, which, which is not uh, out of the uh, ordinary common. So starting at reach or the percentage of red and green people and how represented are they that participate, we may get a 30% uh, reduction in participation uh, among blue people for a variety of reasons of access, history, uh, mistrust, et cetera. So if you do this over in the right-hand column, then we're down to 70% of the benefit in uh, one group versus the other. Moving down to adoption, uh, that focuses a lot on the settings uh, that uh, may serve red versus green people. And you might think in particularly of a lot of low resource settings with a lot of uh, low turnover, uh, without adequate time to do things. And so if low resource settings uh, serving uh, green people are 30% like, less likely to be able to participate or to give out the vaccine, we're down to less than half of the benefit uh, for one group versus the other. You can work your way down. I won't uh, bore you with all of it, but the bottom line is this vaccine or intervention, preventive intervention in our case, okay, that looks to be equally effective when written up in the literature, in fact, delivers less than one quarter of the benefit to one group versus the other. Next slide, please. So REAIM has changed a lot uh, over the years. I don't have time to uh, take you through all of that. Um, I do recommend a website that I'll mention to you uh, later, which is just www.re-aim.org. But uh, REAIM has been used in over 700 articles. I do wanna mention that it's used for both planning and evaluation and increasingly to help guide and understand adaptations. Uh, bottom line is there, we also are increasingly using mixed methods and qualitative approaches. And you can see from the star at the top, as we go to the next slide, also a focus on context. This next slide, somewhat busy, but is important. And uh, this is our current figure that tries to be comprehensive about issues impacting uh, re-aim. And it also summarizes our PRISM perspective, which stands for Pragmatic, Robust Implementation and Sustainability Model. And I'll point out a couple important things about it. It, it starts with the re -aim dimensions going around the circle there uh, as they apply to an evidence-based intervention and implementation strategies. Importantly, at the top come in the contextual factors, though, these prism contextual factors in terms of both what's called the external environment. These are issues like policy factors, guidelines, resources, reimbursement, and other uh, broader, more macro level issues, but also at the internal context at the top right there on issues that are characteristics of settings organizations. And secondly, when we talk about context, we mean not just the physical location, but the context in terms of perspectives and interactions and, uh, and history. And then finally, very importantly, and somewhat unique to PRISM, uh, we focus on what we call the implementation and sustainability infrastructure. And that has to do with roles and resources and accountability for individuals to deliver an intervention. Uh, quickly, to the left of the circles there, I just want to mention that the secret, if you will, the secret sauce or how this all fits together, these various components, is what's important. It's not just the intervention components. It's not just the implementation strategies. It's not just the context, but it's how all of these uh, fit together, the, the intersection that is the keto successful program. Next slide, please. Okay, so saying this slightly differently, and as you are all certainly familiar, people uh, exist in a multi-level context of uh, culture and the places in which we uh, live, work, uh, study, and play. 
Uh, context is not only multi-level, but it's also dynamic. And that's my second take-home message. It's also incredibly complex and uh, somewhat difficult to uh, parse out. And uh, because of this, we feel it's really important to use mixed methods approaches. Next slide. Uh, this diagram is a little overly complicated, might be hard to read, but what it's, uh, it's a matrix that's intended to convey, once again, the re aim dimensions going across the top. And then the point is here that there are several cross-cutting issues or key principles that apply at each of the re aim stages. And that's kind of important for really understanding how to uh, apply uh, re aim So at the top, it's this issue across all of them are what percentage of uh, people are participating or meeting goal, achieving some criteria. Uh, very importantly, uh, the two issues that are in black here, representativeness or equity, as I've said before, uh, that's another take home message applies at each stage, but also I wanna emphasize the next to uh, last uh, row there, on prism contextual factors that we just talked about. Those contextual factors can operate at one or more re aim dimensions or levels. Next slide, please. So uh, again, I am gonna uh, need to pick up my speed a little bit, but on this whirlwind journey, we've talked about re aim dimensions and context. Let's take a quick tour through some of the notion about adaptations. Next slide. Okay, so take home message three is adaptations in a program uh, implying a, a implementing a policy always happen, whether we not uh, like it or not, but they're not always bad. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. Um, and I love uh, the quote here from Brian Mittman that talks about in almost any complex intervention program, uh, we can either ignore or suppress variation, heterogeneity, and adaptation, pretend they don't exist, or we can embrace and maybe help guide them, understand them, and assess them. Next slide. So I like to think of, again, in terms of a different type of matrix uh, here, uh, if you uh, look at in the blue, uh, temporally, adaptations uh, can happen during a planning stage, pre-intervention, during the delivery of a program, or towards the end when you're planning for sustainment or dissemination. Adaptations can also be made to the intervention itself, uh, the what, to the implementation strategy, the how, or the setting or the context. And these interventions then in each of these cells can be done for different reasons. They can be done to adapt to culture, local climate, they can be done to adapt to the resources available, and then it can be done to uh, address uh, local uh, issues, particularly driven by uh, and with stakeholders. Next slide. So uh, I'd like to uh, share a thought question with you here or to think about with our focus on evidence-based uh, whatever, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based public health, uh, evidence-based behavioral science that we have is I'd like to ask the question, evidence on what? And this goes back to the basic uh, thesis of REAIM. Uh, we feel it needs to have a broad focus and also ask the question, evidence, what is left out in terms of talking about evidence? And I argue that several factors, each of which is related to equity and a lot to context there are important. I'm not gonna read all of those, but we feel it's critically important, particularly for understanding results and thinking about replication and equity to know about the settings, about the places uh, in which a, uh, a study uh, is conducted. Next slide. So I'm gonna conclude with a few comments about transparent reporting, because I also feel this is really important and that frankly, in a lot of research that we've seen that's considered really high quality research, we do that by not only restricting the populations that participate, but also the settings or who are considered. Often settings that are left out are those that are the most challenged, those that uh, have the uh, patients or participants or community members uh, that, that have the, the greatest social determinants uh, issues uh, to deal with. 
And so we feel it's critically important to participate or to describe this as well as the staff that are delivering the intervention and not just how many participate, but how many uh, decline to participate and why, and maybe even most important, how many are excluded at the first place. Uh, so I just have a couple quick slides that are overly complicated, if we could go to next, but uh, we'll illustrate these issues. The point of this one is this expands upon the widely known consort figure that's used to report on randomized trials. It's almost required. That's in the uh, uh, content area within the uh, parentheses there, common. Those are the original consort. In addition, we like to focus on reporting in the areas in gray and blue that are the setting level contextual factors. And then finally, the bottom and sustainability factors. The next slide will show you in re-aim terms now how this expanded consort uh, works and focuses on these uh, re-aim issues, adoption, reach, and maintenance. And I'll uh, just refer you if you're interested, we have a freely available fillable PDF uh, noted there that I can make available. Next slide. All right, so this is uh, essentially my summary slide, thinking about the re-aim journey or evolution and where are we going in the future? Well, we've recently been and we expect more focus in the future on this issue of adaptations and of cost and understanding costs from the perspective of different stakeholders. Certainly co-creation uh, with again, multiple types of stakeholders at multiple points throughout intervention and iterative use of re-aim. So not just initially and not just for post hoc evaluation. Certainly the contextual factors in line two there is gonna be an increasing focus and we'll be expanding this PRISM uh, model. Uh, we do think, and especially through this expanded consort that we can help address issues of transparency that I feel are strongly related uh, to equity. And I will note that there's been recent discussion in the literature of some misconceptions about REAIM or misapplications that we have tried to address, particularly at our website, I'll drive you to. And then last thing I'll leave you in the bottom line, there's recently been a series of papers. And there's gonna be approximately 17 more in the journal Frontiers of Public Health on recent uh, current applications of REAIM that I'll refer you to. My very last slide, is next and just uh, closing message number four, all models and methods, including re-aim are wrong. And they're wrong because they oversimplify the incredibly complex real world, but some are useful and we hope that re-aim uh, is at least somewhat useful uh, to you uh, by attempting to be uh, pragmatic and more user friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Glasgow. Well, what I can say about your presentation is that it basically gives us 20 years of, of re-aim in 20 minutes. <laughs> and uh, so, so much there. Uh, looking forward to additional growth in re-aim. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Okay, our next speaker then is Dr. Misier Kiel. And uh, please pronounce your name. I don't want to say it wrong, uh, but thank you so much for being there. And of course, we see your uh, marquee slide. So let me uh, take uh, have you take it from here. Great, thank you very much. Um, my name is Michelle Keels, um, and I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. It's always, uh, it's still um, a little bit of a strange experience to do this because you know, you can't see who you're talking to and get any of that feedback. So um, basically glad to be here. Hope you guys are too. And we will take it from here. I'm just going to start my timer to keep myself on track. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So um, essentially what I want to do um, in the beginning is just to really quickly outline um, and frame what the TREP project is and how it's connected to issues of health equity, um, mental health um, equity in the case of this project. So um, as was noted, it is a research practice partnership that's aimed at facilitating um, narrowing the gap between science on toxic stress and trauma and the practices that are implemented in schools um, and 
kind of just to say a little bit about why um, schools is the focus of this um, mental health intervention and why um, that's the role and the path that I'm taking in order to think about narrowing um, health equity um, issues. And then as we go along, we'll talk about some of the challenges that creates. Uh, so, and also a lot of the things that I'm saying in this, in this moment are kind of like the before COVID information that we had. Um, and everything that we know is that this is going to, these issues are going to only be intensified um, in this still current COVID and the near future post COVID moment. But so why schools for this mental health intervention and so essentially before COVID um, shifted everything, approximately 25% of school aged children have experienced one traumatic event, um, psychologically and emotionally traumatic event that would be identified as something that would profoundly affect their development in ways um, that would have um, implications for among other things, their well-being, but also indirectly their educational outcomes. That's 25% of all school-aged children. Approximately 80% of children um, living in high poverty, high crime neighborhoods have experienced one such profoundly um, traumatic event that has significant negative implications for development um, and can affect their life outcomes. And so um, it's an issue that is disproportionately distributed, but then also the resources that kids have and families have in order to access mental health support are disproportionately distributed. So in the um, kind of American um, healthcare system, and when we're thinking about mental health in particular, schools, um, or actually almost all kids, just generally across the system, schools before COVID were already the de facto mental health assessment and service delivery institutions. Um, the estimate was that only 16% of all children receive any mental health services. And of those receiving services, over 70% received those services through in some way that was connected to their school or school setting. And um, one of the reasons, because so few kids, only 16% receive any mental health services, re one of the reasons why schools become so important is because it is essential an institution that touches all kids. And because it is a structured learning system um, that requires quite a bit of self-regulation, it is one of those places where mental health challenges become detectable and kind of rise to the surface. Um, and it is also a place where teachers are very aware of kind of what's um, expected developmental patterns and they're able to see students in comparison to others and raise red flags um, for students that might need mental, um, psychological and emotional supports. So although school is a primary place where kids become identified, <clears throat> National estimates are that over 70% of children and adolescents identified as in need of mental health care and treatment don't receive services. So only a small fraction of those who need services receive them. And it is much, much less likely for kids who are in socioeconomically disadvantaged um, communities and school contexts. So if you want to be able to create a significant um, dent in this and um, improve the services for children, schools essentially are the place to go to do this work. So that's kind of why it's so significant um, that we really focus on schools as a site of um, assessment and service delivery. The, that's kind of like the implementation and the intervention side of it. The research side of this was trying to figure out how do you do this? How do we significantly build the capacity of educators, not turning them into clinicians and counselors, but how do we build their capacity in order to make sure 
that the school and classroom context is as um, psychologically and emotionally supportive as possible and not re-traumatizing for kids who are coping with high level of toxic stress and trauma. So um, go on to the next slide. And so in order to one of the things um, in connecting with the previous presentation, some of the things I'm gonna talk about are those aspects of how do we um, make this work for a particular um, context and environment. And so one of them is how do you communicate it? And one of the things that we learned early on that was really important in communicating this in order to get buy-in and investment in it is that it had to be communicated. Um, although mental health and emotional health and well-being is important, because that's not a factor on which schools are held accountable in any substantial way, um, really needed to frame it for the academic achievement and outcomes that schools are held accountable for. So one of the really important part in communicating this to school districts and to schools was to being able to pull the research and show um, educators how attending to mental health and making this a part of all of the staff in the school, a part of all of their jobs and work would improve the things that schools are held accountable for, which were the academic outcomes. So just that idea of think of how do we make sure that we're communicating it to the stakeholders in, um, and identifying things that they are held accountable for. Um, so we're gonna go to the next one. And um, so just the quick um, focus for what are the components of this intervention this uh, component, which is kind of like is now um, the biggest component and everything sits inside this component, came our kind of second year of doing the intervention in schools. Um, and it, this was part of it, but not a primary focus of first year. And this aspect is prevention and management of secondary traumatic stress among the educators in the school. And so that first cycle of doing this work, one of the things was, was learning how important it was to kind of back up from focusing on the students to first focus on and doing some assessment and work with the educators. Um, and we can go to the next tab. This, um, we went back after that first year to do some kind of search in the literature to try to understand more and get more evidence and citations for what we were experiencing, what was happening. And this was a study that the title is Stress Teachers Don't Make Good Implementers. And so what we were seeing was that um, you can uh, work with educators as much as possible uh, and get them strong, build their capacity. But once the academic year started, based on where their personal stress level um, was and their level of secondary traumatic stress, all of the implementation fidelity aspects of how to do things um, and how to be consistent with this work with students would just go out the window. And so we had to really learn what needed to happen among the adults so that all of the training um, and intervention work would be implemented um, when they were in actual uh, interpersonal interactions with students. And so really needing to figure out what was the adult work that had to happen in order for things to change for students. And then in the next slide, what it shows is those are kind of just the components of the intervention um, that where we work with the adults, the staff in the school to build their capacity to do these things for students and with students so that the environment, um, the context of the school and the context of the classroom and the interactions between the adults and the students and between students and students were um, less triggering um, and, less, and less, uh, less and less context that would compound the trauma that kids were experiencing in their communities and in their homes. So this is um, kind of, a uh, very nice and crisp design that we use when we're talking about it with other researchers. But on the next slide, 
what you'll see is this is kind of like the framing that we use when we are talking about it with our schools and with our educators. And in order to kind of talk about that bottom, educators, educator self-care is kind of like the foundation. And then we're building the other um, bricks of the components of the intervention. Mindfulness, we put as a door very specifically because we can talk about it as needing to um, build, reduce the physiological dysregulation that's happening um, among students and educators in order to do some of the other components of the intervention and so on and so forth. And so we found that this kind of framework and communication tool works much better than the nice um, crisp one that, you, that we had on the previous um, slide. So again, a lot of this has been about learning how to communicate the same context um, to the audience um, in the ways that resonates with them and connects to them. So the next one. So it's, uh, we've gone through four iterative cycles um, that was really important. And this is where that research practice partnership was really important in because we wanted this to be um, sustainable and um, intervention that wouldn't just work, you know, in a couple of schools where we had um, a substantial amount of resources to be able to go in and through our assistance, um, implement and sustain the intervention for the time that we were there. But really, how can we do this in a way such that uh, we can back off more and more and have it be a self-sustaining intervention that could then scale up to more schools? And so in cycle one, um, and this is also with my naivete that, you know, that I just, about how to do this work. So cycle and how much I learned about um, the work that was going to be needed in order to um, build the capacity um, of educators in our schools. Um, so cycle one, we thought we went in, we developed this conceptual framework, we had all of the pieces and parts, we had you know over a hundred research studies where we pulled interventions that were done in school context with the population that we were working with and then put all of those into individual interventions and individual pedagogical practices and ways of working with students together into this comprehensive um, whole school intervention framework um, and thought that we could go and train them on this conceptual framework and name all of the practices that needed to be adjusted and that they would understand it and they would get it and they did but that doesn't mean that they were able to then put it into practice. And so in cycle two, what we had to do was spend a substantial amount of work. Um, and for me, have getting, onto, getting on my staff um, former educators who had also had some level of um, mental health um, or school counseling um, or social work training so that we could work together with how do we make, um, how do we develop the tools and the training components and the curricula and the manuals for educators that would break down all of these practices into the steps and language that would work for them. And so that was one component, really breaking this down for the audience that we were working with. And the other was, realizing that all of those kind of components, we needed to make flexible entry points um, by allowing schools to prioritize. And we found that we could make them flexible by allowing schools to prioritize um, what would be the best entry point into this intervention, which are the modular components. Again, part of it um, being that we can, um, gain buy-in, that was an important part of this. Um, and then also flexible training delivery. So one of the biggest components for us was learning that first year is getting time, getting time that's needed for people to develop this capacity. Um, and so we had to be really flexible uh, for how we uh, did training versus the first year. 
the cycle three and then four, cycle three, realizing that even after we've done all this additional work in, in cycle two, we had to um, develop coaching models so that we train teachers on the conceptual framework. We um, really give them breakdowns of how this works in practice, but then also had school coaches that would go in, observe for teachers who were still struggling, being able to go in, observe classes, and then provide them with coaching support on the implementation. And then we also found that there were many um, components of the intervention that came from research studies that allowed us to develop the conceptual framework. But when we went back to those studies in research literature, very they told us that particular things did matter, but gave very um, little um, applied advice for how to translate this and make this work across a broad range of schools. And so there was a lot of development that way. And now in cycle um, four, um, we're now in cycle five, but in cycle four, it was how to make this now job embedded learning. Um, because in our schools that we were working with the interventions, we could pay staff time in order to learn um, this work. But going forward, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. And so one of the big things that we're working on now, we're continuing to work on, is how do we make this learning that teachers will need to do, staff in the school will need to do, as job embedded, as, as much as possible, job embedded learning and practice-based learning. Um, and so that's kind of one of the hurdles we're working on now to ensure that it truly will be sustainable. Um, so we can go to the next slide. and. I'm going to, we already talked about that, so we can move on to the next one. Um, and so this is just a quick statement, just to say that we know that implementation takes years. Um, we see in our schools that it takes years. And so this is a framework that we pre present to our schools up front that it's going to take years to build capacity to do this work. Um, however, um, if you can go to the next slide, um, they are evaluated every year. They need to be showing progress and change every year um, or else we can't keep schools and, and principals invested in this intervention because, um, because they're being evaluated every year, every, um, the teachers and the principals. And so we, it's important to use this framework of um, technical change and adaptive changes, uh, which, which helped us and helps us communicate to our schools. So being able to identify some things that um, are very um, technical and can be immediately, when we say technical, meaning it's an administrative mandate um, that could be handed down, broken down into a very small and discrete component and um, it could be implemented across the school with little, with minimal training needs. Whereas the adaptive changes, so while technical changes are happening, we can be working on more adaptive changes that require greater capacity building, um, greater buy-in, mindset, sh mindset shifts, and all of those things in order to um, get implementation correctly. So we can go to the next slide. So just to note that those technical changes can be implemented through administrative mandates made by school leaders, and they're made in response to problems that are easy to identify, have clear solutions, and can lead to quick, a quick um, improvement versus the adaptive, adaptive changes on the next um, slide are ones where we need people to work together. Um, we need to take time to uh, build capacity and all of those things. And so those changes are happening at the same time, but we focus, um, spend a good bit of time focusing on the things where they can see quick change to gain and maintain buy-in. And then to the next one, this is, um, and I think I'm gonna, this is the last one, there might be one, but I'll be able to stop here, which is, um, a way that we kind of work with schools, questions to initiate and guide change. Um, 
And so is there an issue of harm that must be addressed first in order to do this work? So what are some kind of pressing issues around the psychological and emotional health of students that really need to be addressed because that's what everyone's focused on. And so we can't focus on the thing that's going to take two years to change um, and ignore the pressing concerns that they have. Uh, where is their momentum, energy, or interest already happening when we look at those modular components of this intervention? And sometimes that's the entry point in order to gain buy-in. Uh, which components can be shifted through technical change, adaptive change? And also, one of the really big things that we've found, because schools already have a multitude of interventions happening, is that we take our modular components and we try to say, is there something that you are already doing that connects with this component? And instead of asking you to completely change something that you're currently doing, can we strengthen that component? There are versus the other things where you don't have anything in this component of the intervention. And so that we are kind of starting from scratch. But we found that it is, I don't know if it's particular to this group, but with educators, they are used to the cycle of interventions coming, not staying for a very long time, and then being wiped out, and then another intervention being put in. And that leads to a very low level of buy-in for anything new that's coming in. And so we found that it was really helpful if we could connect something that they were already doing to components and modules of our intervention and say, hey, you already, you're already doing something that works for ensuring um, physical safety, which are things like fights and, all, and um, bullying and other things like that in your school. Since you have that and since that works well, let's just strengthen that rather than using um, our intervention components for that element. We found that being able to do that increased the buy-in of the administrators as well as the teachers. Um, and so that's where I'm going to kind of pause. Um, we'll stop with um, what I want to talk about and pass it on to the next speaker. All right, Dr. Keels, thank you so much. Clearly, you have so much a rich presentation of real-world challenges. And so we just have a, a glimpse of them. And thank you so much for letting us in on all of those challenges and we'll have more to talk about. Thank you again. Our final speaker, Dr. Windsor, and let's go directly to you, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll get started again. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm gonna be talking about how um, uh, my team and I combined most the multi-phase optimization strategy and community-based participatory research to build a community-based intervention uh, to reduce substance use. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to start with some definitions. Uh, most is a somewhat new uh, framework uh, for uh, intervention development, and it can be used for uh, developing interventions from the ground up. Uh, or also dismantling existing interventions. Um, most is a comprehensive principle, multi-phase uh, engineering inspired framework. Um, and it's used to optimize and evaluate multi-component uh, behavioral interventions. Um, next slide, please. And uh, CBPR is an approach to research that uh, brings in community members to participate in the research process from beginning through end. The kind of CPPR that I do uh, is, is kind of like on the uh, end of the continuum of uh, CPPR uh, in the sense that I really try to work very hard to share power, uh, decision-making power, so funds, information, and everything with the board members, the, the community members that um, uh, participate in the board. Next slide, please. Now, um, just to, to be on the same page, uh, behavioral health intervention developed under CDPR principles is a set of activities identified, developed, and tested by a team of community members in partnership with researchers to improve health in the community. It can target individuals, families, organizations, communities, and includes more than one component. 
In this, in, in this presentation, I'm not going to talk too much about the intervention that we've developed, but I'm going to talk about the process that I'm going to try to take you guys on a journey uh, with us on the development uh, of that intervention. Next slide, please. So in most, um, one thing that's really important is to find that sweet spot, spot between effectiveness and efficiency, economy, scalability, and community support. And this is what attracted me to this uh, framework that was developed by uh, Linda Collins and her team at the Methodology Center. Um, because when, when I started uh, this work, we really wanted to create a brand new intervention that was completely different from anything that existed, that was really grounded in the community, informed by the community, but that we were keeping in mind efficiency, scalability, and community support uh, in the very beginning of the project, even we before we knew what the intervention was going to be. Um, and next slide, please. And uh, the combination of most and community-based participatory uh, research was very helpful in doing that. Um, most is a framework that relies very heavily in um, quantitative uh, methodologies. Um, in setting hypotheses and criteria a priori, so that later on with the results, you are heavily uh, focusing on the data. In our work, we try to really blend um, scientific knowledge with community uh, experience, right, and in community-built knowledge to try to find kind of like a, a mid-ground. And uh, bringing in the CBPR approach allowed us in the beginning to set this criteria in a rigorous fashion uh, that we could then test. And now we are in the process of doing that analysis. Um, but this chart, it kind of uh, uh, lays out what the different steps are for most. I'm gonna come back to this chart later. If we could go to the next slide, I'm gonna explain to you what each of these steps uh, were in, in our project and um, hopefully give you a more uh, real experienced uh, example of what the, the framework, the combined framework looks like. So I started with my dissertation work way back then, um, about 10 years ago, uh, maybe more, um, well, actually more, um, where I was trying to better understand the experiences of uh, families that were struggling with addiction in urban communities, predominantly African-American in urban communities. Um, and at the time, I, I, I found a, a CBPR and started uh, developing relationships in the community um, to, to develop a board. So the board works um, with bylaws. We, have, we started with very frequent meetings. We were meeting uh, weekly, and this has really changed over the period of time. My board now, it's about um, uh, 10 years old, and uh, it's the same board. We still have some people that are original members, and then we have new members that uh, continue to work. And it looks like we have a problem with these slides. Uh, so I'm gonna assume that you guys can still hear me, I'm gonna to continue to talk and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get these slides back. Um, but anyway, so in the, the stage one, uh, we did this foundation uh, research and developed the board. It's very important in CBPR to provide a lot of training for all board members so that um, we can um, be all on the same page because we have a diverse group of individuals, both from racial, gender, uh, context, and professional backgrounds. Um, and uh, we did training on funding, training on research methodology, training on community issues, training on the issues that we wanted to tackle. And in this step one, too, we were forming uh, the research questions in the sense of um, deciding how to, um, uh, which product, which problems that we wanted to address. Um, so um, what we did, we spent about, first we started working on funding, funding and we, we looked at foundations and internal funding at the university, worked together to put something together. Um, and this initial funding is what uh, uh, um, supported the needs assessment in the ethnographic study um, that, uh, we conducted. Thank you. It's nice to have these slides back. <laughs> um, and uh, 
that led to step two. And it was nice because we started getting a little more effective in, um, in, in reviewing different methodologies that we could take. Um, and most doesn't give you a whole lot of um, um, instruction, if you will, on the initial phases because these phases are supposed to just be the typical methodologies that we use for pilot studies and, and all that type of stuff. And uh, actually, this would connect very nicely with REAIM and use that framework um, early on in the process, I think, could be very helpful. Um, but anyways, uh, we ended up spending about a year uh, bringing in experts, reviewing the literature, and talking to people in the community and decided to come up with this particular intervention that had three components. One was called critical dialogue, which is essentially a group format where people come in and uh, look at these pictures and talk about the, the oppression-related issues and health equity-related issues in their community. The other one is a more individual level component um, where they set goals for themselves. Um, and the last component is a capacity building project that they're expected to develop and join in their community to improve health in the community. Um, and the whole idea for this project is, in, is grounded by uh, um, an equity framework and critical consciousness where um, we are going beyond individual level uh, uh, variables not variables, but all the variables are at the individual level, but the discussion is really trying to uh, integrate um, community level issues, policies, culture, and all of these things into um, impacting individual behavior, but also community uh, behaviors. So we did uh, initial pilot funding. Well, we got pilot funding from the university to pilot the intervention. And we piloted all three components um, to see uh, acceptability, feasibility. Um, this was a pre post uh kind of um, study. And um, we, we had promising results, um, presented it to the community after the project was done. And uh, collaboratively, we ended up changing um, uh, a few things. Um, with that, we were prepared to go for our big chance, which was the optimization trial, and that's where I'd like to spend a little more time because the optimization trial is uh, a bit different than what most people are used to because it uses a factorial design. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, uh, please. Thank you. Um, we developed an optimization study. The, at this point, it was very messy. The, the whole... Uh, step one to step two took us about five years to accomplish and at that point we were in a very nice place because we had a very strong board that was uh, very well engaged we had identified the problems we had been able to merge the scientific knowledge with the experiential knowledge we had an intervention that we felt really good about um, and we were in the process of writing the grant um, to take it to the next level, and then disaster hits. Uh, three of the board members, including myself, ended up losing our, losing our jobs. Uh, we were in Newark, New Jersey, for completely different reasons. Um, and we ended up being forced to leave the community and go move elsewhere. And in this process, one of the people that lost uh, his job was the director of the community-based organization where we were planning on doing the optimization study. Um, and then at that point, we ended up left with this very difficult decision. Do we go with the organization that has been partnering with us, or do we stay loyal to the director who was a member of the NCCD and the person who had done all of the work? And at the time, we decided to stick with this director who ended up uh, working for a different agency that was one of our partners, but it wasn't a partner that we had such close relationships with. So, um, but we ended up going in that way. Uh, we put together the application anyways. It ended, ended up changing uh, a bit of the research because now we had to figure out how do we do CDPR, not necessarily with everybody in that local context, but how can we do that remotely and bring in some technology so that we can make it work. Um, because the board was so strong, um, 
it does not need me to function. Uh, and that was very, very uh, exciting for me to, to test and find out. So um, they were able to, to carry their part um, in the community and we were able to be successful in getting the grant to be working in this new agency. But then the problem was this new agency turned out to have a very different theoretical, uh, a, a very different cultural framework than what we uh, were using. We, we tended to be more harm reduction and they tended to be more uh, traditional abstinence-based type of uh, organization. We knew that when we, we did the partnership, but because the CEO was really invested in the project and, and wanted to move forward, we thought that it might work. But it ended up being kind of a disaster in that first year um, because the staff there uh, was not supportive to the intervention. Um, we were having a hard time getting them to cooperate. The onboarding process was really difficult and doing CBPR project with a board that includes 20 members, some of them consumers, some of them researchers, some of them service providers and in different locals um, was also a, a bit of a challenge. But um, in year two, we were able to um, shift because of the strong relationships we had, we were able to, to switch organizations and we went back to the original organization and the project ended up being very successful. So what we did with the optimization study uh, and the exciting part about optimization studies is that they allow you to look at individual components of a complex intervention. So instead of looking at the effect of the entire uh, intervention together, it allows you to look at the individual effect of each component but also the interaction effect of these components. So in this slide, we had 16 different experimental conditions. So um, here you're seeing eight of them and they include every possible combination of the three components that we had, which was critical dialogue, quality of life, will, capacity building projects, and then the, com the different combinations of this, these different components and uh, in the different experimental conditions, you can see that the different components were either delivered or not or withheld. Um, and then you had the, num the different numbers of sessions that were required depending on the experimental condition that you were assigned for and what was our est estimated delivery cost. The piece in uh, factorial design and most, uh, in most is that it, it the, the research question becomes, instead of asking, is this intervention effective? What you're asking is, what is the best combination of components that can be delivered given a certain set of criteria? And when you bring in CBPR, the beauty of it is that you're using your community partners to decide this criteria a priori, which is uh, the kind of issues that you are going to have later on when you're doing implementation. Um, that you are now taking into account very early on in the design. In our case, we decided to go with cost. So our goal was to develop an intervention that could be delivered for less than $2,000 uh, per group um, of people. And uh, so we estimated and by default, by design default, there are certain interventions that would automatically be, be combinations that would automatically be excluded just because they would be too expensive. But at the end of the project, what that gives us is uh, two different uh, outcomes. One is a manual that is the most effective manual for that particular outcome. In our case, it was substance use. And the other one is the best combination of components that you can use and have a good effect on the outcome, but that can also be delivered under a particular set amount of money. That could be dosage, uh, or it could be any other type of criteria that you and your community decide that is critical. And then you have to figure out how do we connect that in the design of the project. In our case, we also looked at uh, facilitators. So we ended up with 16 conditions. These are eight of them that were delivered by a licensed facilitator. And then we had another batch of eight combinations that were then delivered by a peer facilitator. Um, let me see how I am doing on time. I want to make sure I, I don't go over. So um, if we could go back uh, to the, the slide, that, that one, perfect. Um, 
So we are now in this uh, blue diamond uh, where we are asking, is community, what is the name of our intervention? So is it expected to be effective? And uh, we are in year four of the study, so we just have fresh preliminary results, uh, I mean, fresh results coming out. I'm not going to focus on that today, but uh, yes, we found the intervention to be promising, so we're going to the next step. We have submitted a continuing uh, renewal for the application, and the feedback that we got from the, re the reviewers is that uh, they would like us to uh, kind of skip the effectiveness uh, trial to go straight into implementation because they felt like um, because the factorial design is a randomized uh, design and in the implementation design we're going to have a, a randomization again they felt that uh, it was not necessary to do the efficacy trial so we're now working on the proposal to readapt that the other issue that we're trying to do too is the issue of generalizability in other settings because obviously we had a problem with a particular agency so we're trying to define context in what type of uh, um, environments and communities would this intervention be effective now the last thing that i really would like to bring your attention to uh in terms of uh, uh the most cbpr approach um one thing that I find to be very exciting about this this uh, framework is that our interventions are often not that effective, right? We have a fairly low uh, effect sizes in general. What this allows by having us uh, look at specific components, it's to perhaps over time as people continue to test components and you know which ones are the most effective, we can start getting rid of components that are just dead weight, that are not really important to change the outcomes, and start combining new interventions um, that are only using components that actually have efficacy for different outcomes. Um, in that way, potentially increase the potency of these interventions, but also use existing data to change um, to decide what kind of components and what levels of components would be more effective in one community or in another com community because you want to have the data you can just change the setting so for example i could just say well um instead of 2000 i want to know what are the components we should use if i had to deliver the inter intervention for one thousand dollars for example and i would be able to have data that would give me that granted it would be limited to the sample that i have but that would be a very strong pilot data, giving you a good sense of, of where you might want to want to begin. So I'm going to stop it, stop here because I am at, right at uh, 20 minutes. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll be around if anybody has any questions. All right. Oh, and well, thank, thank you, Dr. Windsor. Community member, sorry, I forgot the last slide. Oh, please do that, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge my funder and uh, my dear colleagues in Newark, uh, members of the NCCB, the NJCRI, the organization that we are working with, and the University of Michigan and University of Illinois. Absolutely. And certainly one takeaway is here in the process, you discover all kinds of things that happen and you have to adapt to those new conditions. Congratulations on getting through all of that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, without Do further ado, uh, Karen, uh, let's see what questions we have from the audience for the panel. All right. Hi, Karen. I uh, wanted to connect with you. Can you can you hear me? Now we can. Yes. I okay. wanted to see what questions that uh, we may have for the panelists. We had uh, a question earlier. I'm going to go back to it. It was for Dr. Keels. What were the biggest barriers to doing this work, and how did you address them? Oh, many. Um, I, to be honest, one of the biggest barriers to doing this work was my own, um, and um, not being a K-12 educator, uh, and so applying my perception and understanding um, of their work context um, in develop in thinking about um, how we were going to translate the research um, into um, practice as well as um, their their other demands, their other contexts, the other things, uh, the other accountability pressures 
and issues that they were juggling. So that I think was one of the biggest ones was really um, partnering with them. Um, uh, really, we even um, brought educators in residence to the university in our in the summertime um, in order to kind of review all of our materials and help us adjust them um, so that they were much more adapted to the audience um, that we were trying to reach. And so that, I think that was, there were many challenges under that, but that was the big umbrella was needing to make sure my, uh, my understanding of their context. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for that. Clearly there are numerous challenges that we face. <laughs> Some of them are unanticipated. They happen and you, life happens and you have to uh, adapt, adapt to them. Uh, another question, if we have one, uh, Karen? I don't see any. Um, so uh, Russ suggested you may have some questions or some thoughts about the commonalities between the talks. Sure. Well, you know, I, I think it's it's very interesting that in all cases, one of the issues is that it takes time to step through the different activities, but it's in the investment of doing something that's going to truly help the receiving community and then, of course, adapt it or adjust it for other communities as well. Uh, I would ask the panelists, given your uh, different views on the steps taken, how can this be done in a way that is both uh, balancing the issue of reach, helping to get things out to the community desperately needed, but also making sure that the intervention is strong enough to make a difference in that community? I know this is a broad question, but it certainly is something we continue to face uh, in, in doing this. Who'd like to start? I guess as we all have uh, some some thoughts. It, it is it is a tough question, but uh, I guess I would say there is a lot to be gained by an intervention that can be so alluring that many people not only want to do it but there is great benefit to them. How do we uh, at least think about getting to that point? Well, I, I can offer a couple of comments and then invite my uh, my colleagues to jump in from their experience. Um, to me, I think there's often more than one intervention or program, not always, that are often there, there can be a list. And I find it helpful to work with stakeholders uh, right, right from the get-go uh, to think about choices and to talk with them about their priorities or outcomes. And often that uh, includes, but has many other key things that they see as value or benefit in addition to whatever our outcome is, whether our outcome is behavior change or improvement on a score or improved glycemic control, that they have other priorities also. So I think taking those into account and looking at, uh, at uh, likely uh consequences of, of different interventions, sometimes comparing them, even modeling them, maybe using a formal modeling procedure, but if not, just kind of talking through uh, consequences and experiences and things I, I think can be helpful. The, the other thing that we often say is, back to this issue that I see as a commonality of adaptations, is I've never seen a program that works perfectly as drawn up. Even if you have perfect stakeholder engagement from the outset and you do perfect model things change context change and so i think being able ready to work together uh to adapt those uh changes and i'll, I'll stop there i think there are subtleties involved with adaptations too but those would be my thoughts i'll go ahead and jump in um thank you russ yeah any thoughts yes so um I am a big proponent of uh, community-based participatory research. And for us, it was spending a lot of time on doing the due diligence to get to know the community, to really getting to know the context and uh, doing research. But I think also very important to spend enough time uh, blending the science with the community experience and knowledge. 
and making sure that you're finishing that process. Um, it takes time, it takes patience, um, but I think that if you do it, it ends up saving you a lot of uh, heartache um, and problems uh, ahead. But even when you do your due diligence and you do all this qualitative work, uh, the world still changes, right? Who would ever know that we would be today wearing masks, right, and in the situation that we are right now. So I think that we need to be able to be flexible uh, as well to, and, and develop interventions that can be adapted and, and, and modified for the, not just the different contexts, but also the different times. Yes, I would agree with both of those contents, uh, comments, essentially, that as researchers, that um, if we can go enter into it with the flexibility that we only have part of the answer, um, and that it is then in with partnership with um, implementation context, that we will get um, that merge between those two uh, is going to get the ideal uh, to actually get buy-in and it will work. Okay. Oh, good. We we have another uh, question there. Uh, let me read that. Oh, Karen, would you read it, or I can certainly do that. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. What are the top three lessons you have learned and what guidance would you provide in relation to developing research programs and addressing health disparities and equity and in intervention programs? Or maybe through intervention programming. I can go. Uh, so for me. So guidance about, go ahead, yes. Yeah, for me, a huge yes. one is to listen. Listen more than you talk uh, and listen deeply. Um, the second one for me is to embrace failure and humility in that sense, because the more uh, we fail, the more we learned and the closer we got to better solutions. Um, and I think that the last one is to don't underestimate the power and importance of relationships uh, with your community and the people you're trying to serve. Very good. Yeah, Very uh, I really would just uh, mostly have to just agree with those things. Um, relationships are huge for getting you in the door and keeping you in the door when you are experiencing all of the failures. Um, because those failures will come, um, things will go not go as intended, or um, what the research says does not at all um, play out with the actual constraints and opportunities of the context. And so really being um, able to have communication and conversation, but, and, and just like that, like academic um, flexibility and researcher flexibility in all of this is just so huge rather than um, something that we are designing um, that we think that these are the absolute components that have to be implemented in a particular way. Um, I think are those, those, those things and just and also maintaining that um, cultural context. And so all of those things come through being flexible, being where failure is, is where you learn um, how to adapt um, and then, but th that relationship um, to get in the door and be able to have those conversations and learn. Well, those are uh, wonderful uh, comments, probably much better than what I can offer. But one thing I'm hearing, I'll, I'll give you my three very quick bullet points. But I think maybe uh, unless we have other questions or Philippa, you wanna go somewhere else, talking about this issue of flexibility or adaptations and partnering and guidance and stuff like that might be uh, a worthwhile one to uh, explore, discuss some more, because at least in my experience, often people don't consider that good science or review committee or whatever, because you change things. And I think this notion of balance 
between and, and really getting into the, the nitty gritty of balance between fidelity and adaptation is, is a really core issue, I think, for, for all of our fields. But very quickly, I think three things I would say in addition to all of those are one, keeping in mind different things work in different situations. There's no one size fits all, even communities that look to be the same at the outset, I, I think are, are different. Second, I found that there's almost always unanticipated consequences. And again, we use our re-aim lens, but again, a classic one is if we really wanna double down on effectiveness, which is where programs go, that usually really results in limited reach or in limited adoption or settings that we can go. Because you select out, select for the people that are the most motivated, that have the most resources and that sort of thing. And then the third one is cost. I think we've given far too little attention to cost, but I don't mean just dollars and cents. I mean things like burden and cost and opportunity cost and how this fits with what you're doing and your values and things. Yes, and, and so what I'm hearing is that, that there are some interlocking issues. You go one way, you may lose a little on the other end, and how do you optimize all of that? It's really a challenge, of course. Uh, I see that there were some more questions. Karen, uh, anyone uh, that you think would be really good? And I think, obviously, we've got about less than 10 minutes, so we'll keep going as long as we can. Okay. So a um, question for Dr. Mercer, how do you think components might look different in a different community? What were the characteristics unique to this community that you believe drove some of the component selection decisions? So I think that, is that me, Mishari? Um, Sorry, I'm reading it from, what was somebody else wrote? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's in some ways less of an issue for um, for me and the intervention because we um, trauma responsive, trauma responsive, trauma sensitive, trauma informed schools interventions start from the point of this is a flexible framework that has to be done in partnership or in adaptation with the school. And I think that's just part of the nature of working with schools is that they are so varied in the um, communities that they serve, what those kids look like, what those families look like, as well as the resources that they have. And so I think anybody that's worked in schools for any length of time realizes that school to school, district to district, things are just so variable. So if you start with a very inflexible intervention, you're it's not you're you're lost from the beginning and so we start with the framework and part of our initial training with um schools and conversations with schools is that we are not giving you a prescription which is actually was difficult because many of them said many of them wanted a prescription because it's more frustrating when it is um this is a framework these are uh, several modular tools and we need to figure out how this is going to work in this context. So part of our work with you is training you, developing your capacity, your capacity to figure out how to adapt this to your context. Um, and that's just because going in, we knew that anything prescriptive would fail in the majority of the context. Um, and so I think uh, that might be more of an issue for some of the others who have a more, because of the nature of the intervention, it's more prescriptive. And I'm not sure. Uh, to piggyback on that, uh, what we did with our intervention was to try to create kind of like a skeleton that left a lot of room for people to create the muscle, right? So that way it can be, it gives the, the facilitator enough flexibility to bring in some, some different components. So. What do you think? There's another question here. It says, going off Dr. Keel's response, do any of the panelists have suggestions for building multidisciplinary teams and within and outside academia to ensure effective, equitable, and sustainable interventions? Yeah, we, um, uh, that was, again, one of uh, like my huge um, learning points is that now um, the intervention, well, before we even got into schools to do the intervention, we had to spend um, time partnering with the school district um, 
it, so that what we were doing, we knew would work and would fit within um, any school districts that we were working with. Now we also partner with teachers unions um, and um, kind of our last area that we have not got yet is to partner with kind of parent advocacy organizations. Um, so, but, but partnerships are, are huge, I think. Um, but for us, that's, that's something that we are still learning. Um, that's why we, I don't say that our, our intervention is a, is a um, kind of um, participatory or community participatory um, intervention. Ideally, that's where we want to get because these things are so culturally contextual. Um, but we are still working through institutions. I, I would say uh, three things. Um, I think the first one is respect um, that goes across there and being able to understand and realize each participant for their expertise that they have, given, given their life experience and, uh, and training. Second is just time. I don't know there's any way around that. I don't think you can bring a group of people that have never interacted with each other together and different places together and expect that ma uh, magic is going to uh, happen. And I think maybe rather than diving in, I experience the technical things right away, just getting to know each other a little bit in terms of their perspectives and, uh, and values and uh, what key things with a collaboration uh, each party's looking for. I will mention uh, that I've just recently become aware of and was embarrassed I didn't know it before, but a wonderful edited book that Kara Hall, uh, H-A-L-L, uh, Kara's with a K, from the National Cancer Institute edited on team-based science. I think a couple years ago it came out and I think it's just a wonderful compendium uh, talking about this issue and pretty much everything that you could think about, about uh, transdisciplinary uh, collaborations, both among different scientific applications, but also with community uh, members. Oh, absolutely. And you know, we're down to our last three minutes. And uh, what I wanna do is take the time to express our gratitude to each of you for such a information filled and an informative session. And clearly, uh, this is a labor of love. Working with community is a labor of love, all the way from meeting, engagement, the, the, the marriage, and then weathering the, the storms that come uh, from the outside or inside. And that, so this is the application of science through the process of marrying the community or people in other communities and trying to express science through them. And uh, this is a window into that process, which is complex. It's got its challenges, yet each of you have made a major contribution to getting that done. And so, of course, we expect you see some really good work coming into the future that captures more of your wisdom. I would just say that in the two minutes we have, I think it's important for the last word to come from each of our panelists. So one take home message that you'd like to give of our different members. And uh, let's begin well with Dr. Glasgow. We'll go in order. Any final thought? Uh, tough one. I'll go back to that one slide that I had. Just say adaptations and the balance between fidelity and adaptations and that adaptations are not bad. Uh, they, they can be good or bad, but need to be understood and embraced. Um, I would say that this Very is good. an amazing and wonderful moment despite all of the stressors and um, traumatic things that are happening for researchers to kind of take off their researcher hat in, in terms of getting data and studying things and thinking about how can we um, help various communities with the information that we've already learned and that in that kind of helping, we are also learning, but um, there's lots of things to balance in this moment with um, continuing our research with fidelity um, and um, being able to help communities that need support. Thank you, Dr. Keels. And last but not least, Dr. Windsor. I would say that um, this is very hard work, um, very intense, um, but it's certainly very much worth it, very much needed. Um, so don't give up, keep at it. 
All right. Well, with that said, thank you so much again to you and to those that uh, have been here listening to this. Uh, we wish you the very best and look forward to next year, another panel such as this one. Take care and be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.